an exceptional panel here to discuss the situation and suggest what might be able to be done. I will introduce them and then they will make presentations after which we will deal with questions and answers that you can type in uh, for uh, during the during the discussion. Our first speaker is going to be retired General Lieutenant Lieutenant General Ben Hodges is currently the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis and a member of Friend, Friends of Ukraine Network. He's a West Coast graduate. He has he served several tours as the Army's Congressional Liaison Officer, so some of you watching from Capitol Hill might remember Ben from that time. Among his numerous cam, uh, command positions, Ben became the commander of the United States Army in Europe in 2014, holding that position for three years until retiring from the Army in 2017. He knows Europe. He knows the threats we face there. Our second speaker will be retired Admiral Ihor Kabanenko. He served as a senior flag officer in the Ukrainian Navy and is a distinguished fellow at the New Westminster College. He was educated at the higher Naval College in Sevastopol, is fluent in Ukrainian, English, and Russian, holds two master's degrees and a PhD. He is, those studies are in risk management and conflict resolution. He is the author of various um, papers and, and uh, studies. His numerous military positions include first deputy chief of the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine, chief of the main operational directorate of the general staff, chief of the U Ukrainian Navy and military representative to NATO. Our third speaker is Dr. Stephen Blank. He's a senior fellow in Foreign Policy Research Institute here in Washington. He has published over 900 articles, I know because I can't keep up with them, on Russia, Soviet studies, U.S., Asia, European, military, and foreign policies. He's testified before Congress, and he's advised the CIA. He's chaired numerous international co conferences in the U.S., in Florence, Prague, London, and he, too, is a member of the Friends of Ukraine Network. Our fourth speaker is Bogdan Us Usinomenko, is a maritime attorney who, among many, many other things, is an expert in the laws that apply or should apply to what's going on in the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. He has participated prominently in numerous conferences on this situation in the Black Sea and has offered a number of analysis for, of the situation. Markian Belinsky is the vice president of the uh, U.S. Ukraine Foundation. He's in Kiev. He will uh, assist with the questions and answers, uh, well, at least the questions at the end of the pro at the end of the uh, presentations. So, with that, General Hodges, please start. So, Bob, thank you. Um, five points to get us started here. Well, we are, of course, are in the era of great power competition. Uh, this war between Russia and Ukraine is a part of that competition. And it's part of a broader Black Sea regional context. The Black Sea is Russia's launching pad for what they're doing in Syria, Libya, and the Eastern Mediterranean. And they will stop at nothing to ensure that they can have unrestricted use of the Black Sea region, as we have seen from their illegal uh, annexation of Crimea, uh, the blocking of the Sea of Azov, uh, the borderization that they're doing in Georgia with occupation of 20% of Georgia, and the more than 10,000 troops uh, under their command in Transnistra. And then the continuous uh, attempts to enforce the illegal and unauthorized exclusive economic zone and territorial waters that they claim around the Crimean Peninsula. The second point is that Ukrainian soldiers are being killed and wounded every week, years after the ceasefire was agreed. They're still being killed and wounded by Russian troops and by proxies who were officered and equipped and supplied by Russia. And there are still many Ukrainians in captivity. However, Ukrainian soldiers have demonstrated uh, their toughness and their resilience. They're very good soldiers. They
They have stopped the Russians where they are now. And the only way that Russia could change this is if they uh, get from behind the facade that they're not actually involved and begin to employ air power and more sea power. The United States Army has learned a lot from Ukrainian armed forces uh, about how Russia fights. And in fact, we have dramatically changed our training methodology uh, based on what we learned from Ukrainian armed forces. The third point is that the United States and our great alliance, NATO, need a strategy for this region. We don't have a strategy for the Black Sea region. Without a strategy, you don't have the prioritization of, of the necessary resources to do what needs to be done. We also need a strategy that would provide a framework for policy for how the United States uh, interacts with Ukraine, how the United States interacts with Turkey. Uh, and if once we get a strategy in place, of course, then we can have the right kinds of resources. Part of the problem for not having a strategy for the Black Sea region is that policymakers in Washington, D.C. and in Brussels don't understand or value the strategic importance of the Black Sea region. The fourth step, or the fourth point, is that uh, we together, this is the United States, Germany, and France in particular, but other European allies um, have got to hold Russia accountable for all of their violations of international law, not look the other way. Uh, we have got to support Ukraine and to continue pushing forward the Minsk process. Uh, we have got to support economic investment in the region. The port of Anaklia was a perfect example uh, in Georgia. If this port, this deep water port had been completed, it would have been a game changer for economic uh, opportunity in the Black Sea region, which of course, may, and would also mean that Western European countries would invest in Georgia. And if they invest in Georgia, then they become much more interested in the security and stability of Georgia which is exactly why the Kremlin put so much pressure on the leadership uh, of the Georgia Dream Party and the government has stopped this project. This is part of the competition. Also part of the competition is that uh, every EU nation and every uh, NATO nation should declare that no ship, no Russian vessel sailing out of any port in Crimea should be allowed to enter a, Euro a EU port or the port of a NATO country, that these ships should, these ships should be considered poison because of their use, illegal use of Ukrainian ports in the Crimean Peninsula. So this is part of the economic pressure and diplomatic pressure we should be putting on the Kremlin. And then finally, the fifth point, uh, it's about cooperation between the Black Sea nations. Uh, recently, Ukraine and Romania uh, made an agreement uh, back in February during the Munich Security Conference between the ministers of defense to improve information sharing uh, and training and to improve training opportunities. This need, needs to be expanded to all Black Sea nations uh, to improve cooperation, improve intelligence sharing and improve training. But this cooperation needs to take place in Washington DC as well. If all of the nations of the Black Sea region would put their voices together, all the ambassadors would put their voices together the way that Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania did, you would be much louder and would, would be much more effective at getting uh, interest in building advocacy on Capitol Hill, uh, as well as within the various branches of our government. You would need to do the same thing, of course, in Brussels, Berlin, and Paris. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, General. Uh, Admiral? You're moot. Uh, thank you. Let me uh, begin uh, with uh, very, very uh, clear information what uh, the security uh, situation uh, in the Black Sea uh, still continues to be unstable. And uh, Russia is creeping annexation of Ukraine's sovereign, sovereign, uh, sovereign sea waters in continuing. Uh, in fact, most uh, Ukraine's maritime exclusive economic zone it's over 80% of uh, sovereign waters uh, is under Moscow's control. Moscow's control, it's uh, Ukraine doesn't control this, those waters, what, uh, those maritime areas. Uh, uh, generally, Russia achieved naval dominance at the Sea of Azov and in some key maritime areas in the northern 
uh, part of the Black Sea. It should be noted. It should be noted uh, that uh, this January increasingly uh, grandiose uh, Russian naval exercise took place in the Black Sea. Uh, well known what Russian President Putin observed this drill. More than 30 warships uh, took place. Russia's hypersonic Kinjal missiles, uh, uh, long, missile, one missile was launched as well. And uh, during this exercise, Russia deployed, deployed uh, its uh, missile cruiser from Northern Fleet uh, near Karkinitska Bay. It is just dozens of miles from Ukraine's national territory. Uh, Russia announced large-scale military exercise Kavkaz 2020 uh, to be held in September. Uh, this time they will have up to 100 ships, warships, Participate, participating, uh, it would uh, constitute an unprecedented, unprecedented uh, Russian military build-up build in the region. Uh, uh, I should, it should be noted that experts uh, warned uh, of a next conflict initiated by Russia and Ukraine may be to ensure water supply for Crimea uh, via North Crimean water channel connecting, uh, connecting uh, the Dnieper river with uh, Crimean Peninsula. On uh, February 5th, uh, the peninsula only had enough drinking water for uh, the next 100 day, days. Uh, situation in Crimea becomes worse uh, because this year uh, very dry winter is spring uh, time. Even in Ukraine, we have a problem uh, because rivers, rivers water level achieved historical minimum uh, over the last uh, uh, 100 years. Operational analysis evidence what the Serpent Island and the Chakiv, strategically important Ukraine's uh, Chucky points, are under the, the Russian uh, threats as well. Uh, what should be done to avoid negative scenarios at sea? Because it it's really uh, exists uh, a lot of threats and uh, uh, activated threats and uh, uh, some negative scenario, scenarios, is, scenarios is, uh, are predictable. Uh, of course, we appreciate the role of uh, what played by the United States and NATO states for security in the region. Uh, this is not easy time for naval activities because coronavirus uh, spreading, however, had better to keep the same level of uh, Western, uh, first of all, the US warships patrolling and port visits in the region as it was last year because now we see uh, uh, decreasing of such visits. At the same time, uh, Ukraine should do more from my perspective. Well known that capabilities of the naval forces of Ukraine are weak. Uh, it urgently needs to be improved. Uh, uh, some influential uh, Ukrainian uh, political military authorities think what Ukraine has chance to deter Russia if its symmetric naval capability, capabilities will be built. But it is an uh, ambitious dream only. Moscow has absolute naval supremacy in both seas compared with Kyiv. In this situation, Ukraine should demonstrate political maturity and professionalism in, in its Syrian maritime rights protection. Neither, neither a political uh, uh, populism and continental mentality nor Corvette program or some kind of conceptual spaghetti can solve accumulated problems at sea. I'm on the side of uh, quick as possible Ukraine's so-called mosquito fleet uh, capabilities building with the US and uh, other partners, partners uh, assistance, as it was mentioned in Ukraine's naval strategy up to uh, 2035. This approach will allow Ukraine to deter Russia asymmetrically, it is an important thing. Uh, and uh, adequately respond uh, on its aggressive actions at sea. In this regard, the US Mark VI boats looks like, look like a very good opportunity, very effective mosquito platform, islands as well. Uh, Ukraine should pay more attention uh, on defense and security partnership uh, with our partners uh, in the region. I absolutely agree with General Hodges, and particularly including Turkey. I remember how Turkish frigate uh, uh, accompanied uh, Ukraine frigate Hetman Sagaidachny in its way to Odessa after participation on, on, in the NATO and uh, EU anti-piracy operation in the Indian Ocean. 
Let me remind what it was at the beginning of March 2014, during Crimea annexation by Russia, when most Ukraine's warships were blocked in their naval bases in Crimea. So intensive Ukraine-Turkey uh, political military dialogue is needed, including Crimea sanction, sanctions regime keeping, as well as common crisis prevention and response activities. Montreux Convention could be one of uh, dialogue bullets as well. At the end of my short speech, I call Ukrainian and American colleagues uh, to look very precisely on spring, so we have not so much time to close Ukraine's naval capability gaps and to keep a stable situation in the Black Sea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral. There was a little bit of breakup in your uh, transmission there at the very end, um, but uh, the message was pretty darn clear. Uh, Dr. Blank. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to build on what my esteemed colleagues have said because I agree with everything they have said, uh, and I've worked with them in many previous venues of this sort. Russia's objectives are to close the Black Sea to the United States and to all of NATO and to exploit its energy holdings. They seized those holdings right after uh, seizing Crimea. And the ultimate objective is not only to exclude NATO from the Black Sea area and enhance Russian pressure and influence, not only on the littoral states, but in, in its ability, as General Hodges said, to project power throughout the Mediterranean into the Middle East, but also to destroy the foundations of an independent Ukraine. What we have to understand is that if you understand what Ukraine means to Russia in terms of history, culture, politics, and strategy, the men in the Kremlin cannot accept the idea of an independent Ukraine. Even more, they cannot accept the idea of a democratic Ukraine and will do everything in their power to destroy it. And the strategies that they are carrying out in the Black Sea are aimed at isolating Ukraine, from military assistance from the West, from conducting what Admiral Kabanenko has called the boa constrictor strategy economically to uh, swallow up or extinguish Ukrainian maritime trade. They have seized uh, the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait in defiance of bilateral agreements that were negotiated and signed before the war. Their aggression against Crimea and in the Donbass violates five treaties that Russia made with Ukraine. So we see that the treaties have very little relevance to Russia's thinking. Indeed, Russia does not really accept the sovereignty and territorial independence of any of the countries east of Germany in Europe. Their diplomats regularly say so, their experts say so, and they refuse to admit even that they have troops in Ukraine, but they will never concede that Ukraine has the right to an independent existence. That's what's at stake. So what does this mean for the United States? First of all, it is an attempt to undermine the entire post-Cold War settlement and threaten European security and restore a Russian empire with power projection not only into Central Europe, but as we see now into the Mediterranean, into the Middle East, and into North Africa and even Central Africa in order for Russia to get its way. Furthermore, we have a concept in the US policy that goes back to the War of 1812, if not even earlier, of freedom of navigation. What the Russians have done in the Black Sea and the Straits uh, of the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait are outright violations of the freedom of navigation and the law of the sea. And they have been emulated by other powers who see that or believe they can get away with this. What we see China doing in the South China Sea, what we see Turkey doing in the Mediterranean vis-a-vis -vis Cyprus. Russia has done this as well in the Sea of Akhotsk, would like to do it in the Arctic if the UN recognizes the Arctic as theirs. So Ukraine is vital to European and American security interests. It deserves the help that Admiral Kabanenko has talked about the naval assistance. It needs the NATO support from General Hodges's point of view. That is that NATO have a real strategy, how to help Ukraine, how to enter the Black Sea, and how to defend the Black Sea littoral states, and to support countries like the, Georgia in the Caucasus. 
So what is happening in the Black Sea is really a microcosm of the larger challenges to the West and to the United States and to the ideas and values and interests which they uphold. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, very helpful comments. Um, Bodan Uzumenko, uh, you can take it from here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Could you hear me? Uh, I totally, totally agree with uh, Stephen and uh, thank him very much for these clear messages and really uh, maritime security topics have a vital importance, maritime security topics of uh, Ukraine has a vital importance not only for my country but for the whole of Europe and even the US. And uh, really situation in the region of the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov is uh, extremely tense. And uh, I can compare this situation maybe only with uh, the only region in the uh, ocean. Uh, it, it maybe it is uh, South China Sea's atmosphere of conflict. And I think uh, that uh, Black Sea and South China Sea are the most troubled sea areas in the world. But let's return to Ukraine. Bob, could you please uh, show us uh, slide number one? I'm having trouble. There we go. Can you see it? No, 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 no. I don't know why you're not. Um, I can, uh, maybe I can do it by myself. Uh, one moment, please. One moment, please. Uh, could you see it? I, I can see it now. Can everybody else see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the total square all the Ukrainian sea areas uh, before the Russian invasion was 137,000 square kilometers. Since 2014, Ukraine has lost control over about 100,000 square kilometers of its sea areas. The Russian occupied uh, Ukrainian sea territories equals, for example, to the total area of South Korea or other state, Iceland really very huge territory. Russia is excluding Ukraine from enjoying the very rich hydrocarbon and fisheries resources within Ukraine's own maritime areas, territorial sea and exclusive economic zone. And I want to underline this fact one more time. Russia occupied 80% of all Ukrainian sea zones and this maritime creeping occupation is still going on. Admiral said it before. I strongly believe that in such a critical situation, Ukraine should take five steps in the sphere of maritime security. Step one, establish the breadth of the Ukrainian territorial sea. It is necessary for Ukraine to adopt the law on Ukraine's internal waters and territorial sea. This law must set the width and the outer border of its territorial sea, temporarily until the occupation occurs establish a special zone within Ukraine's territorial maritime belt around the Russian-occupied Crimean Peninsula. And I will show you the next, the next slide. I'm sorry. One moment. Slide two. Slide two. Mm -hmm. Within this special zone, it is in pink, uh, Ukraine should ban any movement by or presence of non-military shipping and warships. After the establishing of the special zone, Ukraine must add to the Ukrainian criminal code a special article that extends criminal responsibility to captains of cargo vessels and the management of shipping companies for violation of the special zone around Crimea and pursuing the individuals involved using all available instruments, including Interpol mechanisms. 
Step two, delimitation of the maritime boundaries. And I will show you other slide. Uh -huh, slide number three. Uh -huh. uh, since 1996, Ukraine has been fruitlessly trying to establish a permanent maritime border with the Russian Federation via direct negotiations. But there is a special compulsory procedure for such cases. In accordance with the law of the Sea Convention, it is possible to establish the International Delimitation Commission under the auspices of the United Nations. For the first time ever, the conventionally forced negotiations procedure as for sea boundaries delimitation was successfully applied in 2016 by a small country, East Timor, against Australia. We also know that Georgia has the same problem with Russia in the Black Sea. Russia occupied the most of the Georgian Sea and there is no maritime boundary between the Russian Federation and Georgia too. It will be great if Washington and Kyiv can help Belisi with the delimitation process and synchronize activities of Ukraine and Georgia on the basis of the Law of the Sea Convention with the aim of creating permanent maritime boundaries between Georgia and Russia in the Black Sea on the one side and between Ukraine and Russia in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov on the other side. Together, Ukraine and Georgia will have more opportunities to show the international community what is occurring in the Black Sea and how crudely Russia is violating maritime rights of its neighboring countries. Step three. One moment, please. I will show you the last of my slides. In December 2003, in order to prevent territorial armed conflict around the Ukraine and Tuzla Island in the Kerch Strait provoked by Putin in September 2003, former president of Ukraine Kuchma was forced to sign the agreement between the Russian mm -hmm. Federation and Ukraine on cooperation on the use of the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait, Azov Treaty. Under the Azov Treaty, warships of third countries, for example, NATO and US, may pass through the Kerch Strait and enter the Azov and enter the Sea of Azov only with the consent of both parties, Ukraine and Russia. But according to international law, a treaty is void if its conclusion has been procured by the threat or use of force. That's why Azov Treaty has no legal force and Ukraine should inform all states and the UN about this fact. At the same time, in accordance with the international maritime law, the Kerch Strait is an international strait, since it directly links the exclusive economic zones of the Azov and Black Seas. All ships and aircraft, including those of the third countries, other than Ukrainian or Russian, may enjoy the unimpeded right of transit passage through the Kerch Strait, as well as entering the Sea of Azov. And one more very important message. Montreux Convention does not cover the Sea of Azov. Step four, create a joint maritime operations center. Ukraine should create a small but highly professional joint maritime operations center that will coordinate, coordinate the activities of all civil, military, and law enforcement agencies and enterprises involved in maritime security. The center should also carry out an operational information exchange between its agencies and the counter, uh, counterparties in the US, NATO, and Georgia. A similar center has been uh, already created in Georgia with the US assistance. And last but not least, step five, adopt Ukrainian maritime strategic plan. It is necessary to adopt very practical, realistic, and clear Ukrainian maritime strategic plan and ensure its rigorous implementation. This concludes my statement and thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Bodan. Um, you can stop the screen share at this point. And mm -hmm. for our listeners, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, there's a thing Q&A and there are several questions there. You can type your questions. Uh, before we go to the questions there, 
Uh, one thing, I suppose I, I really direct this mostly to Admiral Komodenko. Um, we, you talked about, and as you know, the uh, Friends of Ukraine Network have been pushing, you know, the United States to support the buildup of a mosquito fleet uh, with the appropriate arms as a defensive measure uh, for what uh, Russia is doing along the coast of, of Ukraine. There's been a change uh, in the Minister of Defense recently. Uh, we had the sense that the previous minister was very much in support of that. What do you see, uh, if any, changes in how the ministry is looking at this situation? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, yeah. From my perspective, uh, you know, discussion still uh, continuing, uh, is still continuing in the Minister of Defense uh, in terms of uh, uh, naval capabilities, what should be created. But on uh, those capabilities, Mosquito of Fleet concept was authorized by uh, Naval Strategy up to uh, 2035. So it's, it's a fact. They should follow this strategy. It should implement that. Unfortunately, uh, since uh, uh, signing of uh, this strategy, it was uh, on November uh, 2018, Nothing uh, has been done in terms of creation of mosquito fleet capabilities. Thanks a lot to the U.S. Uh, for transfer of uh, two uh, island class uh, uh, patrol boats. It's a good capability. It's, it's a first step in this way. But I think we should do more. We should uh, uh, not only ask, not only request uh, the U.S. support uh, assistance uh, in terms of uh, Mark VI uh, uh, fast boats, but also uh, other uh, equipment uh, to protect our sovereignty, protect our uh, territorial waters, and of course our exclusive maritime economic zone. Yeah, uh, Mosquito Fleet, it's not, uh, you know, the uh, final, let's say, composition of Ukrainian Navy, but it's urgently needed uh, capabilities to protect right now our littoral waters. Uh, particular uh, choky points, uh, uh, important areas inside our exclusive maritime uh, economic zone, our, our ports, our territorial waters, and so on in, in different domains. So uh, in this regard, I hope that Minister of Defense will have a final decision, uh, not will follow, you know, dreams, ambitious dreams to build uh, big ships for for that, uh, because uh, operational value of uh, missile board, of uh, amphibious boats, uh, patrol boats, and littoral uh, waters is uh, higher than uh, Corvette. This can be uh, uh, clarified as a, as a target for uh, for enemy. So uh, discussion still continues. Uh, continuing, and uh, I think, I hope, what outcome would be uh, mature, politically mature, and professional. Thank you. Can't hear you. Markian, uh, Admiral, thank you. Markian, do you have a question, or do you want to uh, select from some of the questions that are coming in? You'll need to unmute. Let's go straight into the uh, into the questions. Uh, well, uh, good evening from Kiev, I suppose. First and foremost, <laughs> um, uh, a question here. Please comment on the uh, current and future impact of COVID nineteen on the security in the Black Sea region. This goes with another question about. Uh, Putin being a, uh, an opportunistic predator and taking advantage of these uh, uh, kinds of situations. Very topical question in some respects. Admiral? <laughs> Let me just uh, uh, propose, uh, because of course uh, COVID-19 is influenced on, on different aspects of use of uh, not only naval forces, but what we can see right now in the Sea of Azov, uh, what uh, we, we can see reduction in the duration of uh, artificial delays of vessels before obtaining 
the Russian permission to pass through the Kerch Strait. And it's really right now on a level uh, very narrow to situation when, when, which was in June 2018, just before the blockade of uh, Kerch Strait. Uh, the Black Sea News uh, experts, analysts, and other analysts, uh, maritime uh, analysts uh, of Ukraine think what the main factor, what has caused a reduction in the duration is the spread of the coronavirus in the ship's uh, countries of origin, as well as in occupied Crimea and Russia and Krasnodar Krai, where ships and boats of the FSB uh, Coast Guard of the uh, Border Service uh, are based. Of course, um, uh, it also could be element of Russia's uh, disinformation plan before preparing for flu in Arctic area. But the fact exists. I think it's influence of uh, COVID spread. Yes, we we have another question, Robert. If I Yes, go ahead. Um, it goes like this. A deepening partnership with NATO for Ukraine would be a good factor for enhancing security in the region, especially at sea. According to uh, uh, Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, Vadim Pristaiko, Ukraine is ready to join the NATO Enhanced Opportunity Partnership Program. Is NATO actually ready for this, form of, uh, this format of cooperation? Uh, Stephen? Yes, um, I think NATO is not yet ready for this cooperation. On the other hand, I don't think that it has ever been seriously discussed among all 20 or 30 members now uh, in, in, in an open substantive way. I think frankly that if the United States was to take the lead uh, in putting this table, uh, question on the table, and Ukraine was to continue to make substantive efforts at military and other forms of reform that you might actually begin, uh, begin to see progress on putting NATO, on uh, putting Ukraine on a, a track that would lead to ever closer uh, relationship with NATO that in the fullness of time might lead to something more than the present situation. But for the moment, I'm not sure that that's the case. General Hodges? If I could add just a couple of points. Uh, I actually think that uh, the United States, um, as Stephen suggests, should lead in strongly supporting uh, Ukraine uh, being admitted to NATO's Enhanced Opportunity Partnership Program. We, we should get behind that loud and clear because of the progress Ukraine has made uh, and because obviously of its strategic location. Um, I think that the alliance needs to uh, also demonstrate or provide opportunities to increase this training and relationship with Ukraine by establishing a three-star headquarters uh, in the Black Sea region where, and it needs to be a joint headquarters. Uh, Romania is standing up a, a land headquarters, but the Alliance needs a three-star joint headquarters where people wake up in the morning smelling Black Sea air and uh, that they can keep an unblinking eye uh, on what Russia is doing in the Black Sea region. And of course, having Ukrainian officers be a part of this three-star headquarters that would not be a part of NATO's command structure. It'd be a national headquarters, but you could have Ukrainian officers join this, air, land, sea officers, uh, naval officers that would uh, go a long way towards improving cooperation, but also uh, continued uh, development of understanding NATO uh, standards. The third, the third aspect of this, though, is uh, Ukraine and Hungary have got to sort out uh, the, uh, the, the political issues that they have right now. As, as long as uh, this is a problem, Hungary is never going to allow any uh, forward movement uh, of Ukraine uh, in, within the alliance. Uh, thank you. Uh Markian, there's one question we have. Uh, we all assume that everybody understands what we're talking about, about a mosquito fleet. Would somebody like to explain what a mosquito fleet is? Admiral, maybe you. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, mosquito fleet, it doesn't mean uh, all uh, small boats, all, you know, uh, some reefs and so on. Mosquito fleet means uh, very fast, uh, uh, small platforms, boats, uh, different types, uh, strike, uh, patrol, uh, amphibious, balanced amount of those boats. It's uh, not several, it's uh, tens. Uh, means tens of such boats uh, equipped, uh, which has uh, on board a uh, um, weapon, uh, modern weapon equipment, which has uh, some links, technical links between each other, which allow to uh, fight with a big enemy from different direction to, to, to concentrate efforts uh, and to use the weapon and avoid attack attacks of uh, the enemy. Such platforms exist right now. It's, it's modern uh, defense economy uh, has produced such product platforms and Ukraine needs that. This uh, uh, allows to, uh, to act asymmetrically because symmetrically it's not possible for Ukraine to, to win in the, in the battle if uh, uh, enemy which has a traditional forget, forget uh, destroyers, uh, you know, corvettes and so on, ships. So we should find the best solution, cost-effective solution, because boats are cost-effective. And at the same time, the cello to fight asymmetrically with more powerful uh, naval uh, assets of, of the enemy. Uh, it's just sh short explanation, but uh, uh, we can provide the more information and uh, uh, attenders uh, can find in, in different uh, Ukrainian sources more uh, detailed explanation what does it mean uh, uh, mosquito fleet but generally it looks like that uh, I would I would note I believe all the panelists know this um, the Friends of Ukraine Network's National Security Task Force has recommended uh, to our Congress and to our executive branch that we provide six to twelve uh, mark four, five, or six patrol boats. Uh, the same, the same theory that we advance this argument is what we used when we argued that uh, the United States should give the javelin missiles their deterrent weapon. Uh, the tanks don't roll out where the javelins are, and if you had these platforms with modern weapons on them, it's a deterrent from the uh, Russian Navy. Uh, Markian, other questions? Yeah, this. Uh, Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, there are two uh, similar questions actually. Uh, uh, given the description of the problem and challenge Russia, Russia poses in this region, does not Ukraine need to greatly strengthen its relationship with other literal states, particularly Turkey, which has steadily drifted away from NATO and the West? And then the second question on this issue is, uh, uh, Turkish President Erdogan and Russian President Putin have been building positive relations over the last couple of years. Part of the strategy seems to be that Russia needs positive relations with Turkey to maintain access to warm water. Uh, are the positive relations between Turkey and Russia troubling for the US and NATO uh, presence in the Black Sea as it regards uh, Black Sea security? And as an addendum to that, uh, can Turkey uh, play a special role in regulating the Russian use of, the Black, of its Black Sea fleet in a global manner? I can take uh, that. Stephen. Stephen. Okay. First of all, uh, your questioner needs to know that Turkey has been an extremely strong supporter of Ukraine. Despite the rapprochement with Russia that has been taking place with regard to Syria, on Ukraine, Turkey has been very steadfast. It has supported the Crimean Tatars. It has just signed an agreement uh, on uh, transferring military technology to Ukraine. And the recent crisis that we saw in Syria when Turkish and Russian forces almost came to blows led Turkey to convene a meeting of the NATO North American Council. So there are, one should not over-dramatize Turkish support for Russia, which is a, a problem, but it is not the only game in town or it's not the only aspect of the agenda. Turkey has not deployed the S-400s and is apparently looking for a way to get back to the United States 
and to NATO on a different basis. That does not mean all the problems can be solved, but there are places like Ukraine, Libya, another one, where Turkey and Russia are at odds. So the fact that NATO has now expanded its exercises in the Black Sea means that the Turks have also signed off on this, allowing those exercises on the basis of the Montreux Treaty, even though it's formally peacetime. So there are opportunities here to build on the positive Ukraine-Turkey relationship and Turkey's differences with Russia in, in several key issues. And uh, perhaps an inclination maybe to think that NATO is more important to Turkey than Turkey used to think, to build a stronger relationship. But these things are already happening in place. They're just not getting a lot of publicity. Yeah. Just just a couple of words. Yeah, absolutely agree. And uh, I think what Ukraine should pay more and more attention to build strong uh, partnership with Turkey, uh, not only in a sphere of uh, def defense industry cooperation, but in, in political military sphere, uh, because a lot of uh, initiatives uh, was damaged uh, by Russia, uh, initiatives, the security initiatives in the Black Sea region. I think it's a huge field for new security projects uh, to build uh, peace and in the to keep peace in the region. And uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, Turkey uh, both uh, has a lot of the similar approaches and of course experience from the past how to do that, uh, how to do it. So we need to uh, agree absolutely. We need to to to, to build a, a close cooperation with our partners. A uh, question specifically uh, uh, for Bogdan. Uh, recently, a uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Yenin announced a case in the International Tribunal for the Law of the Seas about the Kerch Strait incident. Um, sorry, just a second. It's, uh, uh, what decision do you expect from the tribunal, and do you think it will have any effect on Russia's behavior? I think yes, this, uh, um, uh, honestly, I don't know the, uh, the all points of this, uh, of this case, uh, but I think, but I think, yes, it, it, it should, it should, it should, um, it should be uh, very, uh, because, 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 you know, I think that, um, it's about us. Uh, this this case is about coastal rights, about coastal state, and Ukraine defend its uh, its position, its position its position like uh, and about fisheries, about uh, about occupied territories and all this all this stuff. But I think um, this uh, this case and this situation. Uh, has no has no quick quick decisions and uh, quick solutions maybe because uh, Russia violates uh, violates all agreements, all decisions, and all uh, all this all this stuff and uh, I think that uh, will be will be more will be more influential if if we launch launch this special delimitation procedure against Russia. Not not this not this case because I honestly I think that um, in the nearest future in the nearest uh, years we 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 won't have uh, we won't have decision. But a situation is uh, but negative situation with Russia is still gone. Or maybe like something like this. Thank you, Markian. Yeah. Um, well, perhaps this is a question that requires some uh, clarification. Um, um, uh, last week, the Parliament uh, of Ukraine, Verkhovna Rada, stalled the legislation for reorganizing Okoroboron Prom, which was the roadblock to the two island-class ships being provided a year ago. Is there a way around Okoroboron Prom? You were going to provide some clarification. I'm going to try. <laughs> um, there, there were plans actually to break up Ukrabaron Prom, which means Ukraine Defense Industry, into six different uh, corporations. 
Those were part of the reform plans of the previous cabinet. Apparently, from what you're saying, uh, those plans have been put on hold. Uh, one of the problems of Ukrainian politics is that there is a tremendous struggle going on between partisans of reform and partisans of the old status quo, or the uh, ancien regime, if you like. So uh, Omaran Prom is clearly an issue here. Um, the only way around it is if the President Zelensky and his cabinet are able to persuade enough people in the legislature that this organization needs to be reform uh, that is a haven of corruption and inefficiency uh, without those reforms, and that it's not going to contribute materially to the war effort. Uh, I think the U.S. encouragement that Oberon Prom needs to be reformed uh, would also help in this matter and help persuade people that uh, it needs to be reformed because it's an obstacle to getting Western assistance. But otherwise, we're just going to have to fight these reform battles, and not only about Ukraine, 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 Prom, but about banking and so on, you know, trench by trench. Uh, yes, General. Um, if I could say, um, you know, I had the chance to visit a, uh, the tank factory in Kharkiv uh, about three years ago, and I was astounded with the, uh, the quality of, uh, of what was coming out of there, the, the repair work that was being done on battle damaged tanks. Uh, and then I, I looked over and I, I saw a long line of brand new tanks and I, and I got really excited. I, I asked the manager there, I said, are these, are these tanks going to the front? Are they headed to uh, uh, the ATO? And he looked at me like, no, these are going to Thailand. These are for export. And this was at the same time that Ukraine was uh, pleading for the United States to provide javelin, and I, so right there, I, I realized we have a problem that a that a country can, that, that can manufacture top shelf armored vehicles for export should also be able to manufacture something equivalent to javelin, and of course they can. So this is a challenge that's, that's going to have to be resolved. Ukraine is clearly capable of of arming itself uh, to a great extent. It's got the technology. Uh, but what they need is sustained support uh, and support that springs from a strategy by the United States for the Black Sea region. When we just have a policy that's tied to a particular administration or focused on specific political issues, we end up not having a comprehensive strategy that provides a framework for developing meaningful policies and sustained support. So. You know, we, we need to settle in for the long haul to support Ukraine, um, not just with holding them accountable but, or, or providing resources, but to make it absolutely, totally clear that we are with Ukraine forever. And the, the Kremlin needs to see that, our European allies need to see that as well. And that only comes if we have a strategy for the region. Then you can fix Ukro Brom Prom. Thank you. I, I do note that um, the Atlantic Council had the head of Hukka Prom on, um, and my impression is that he has been trying to do some very good things. He's got uh, their advisors there from the Department of Defense. Indeed, uh, uh, former Secretary Don Winter uh, is specifically on that assignment working with them. Uh, it's a big issue. There's a lot to be done. Markian? Yeah, uh, next question. What do you think the appointment of General Dayton as ambassador means for the future of the U.S.-Ukraine strategic partnership? Obviously, that will impact the uh, development of, uh, of how uh, the U.S. assists uh, Ukraine in developing a, a Navy and a maritime strategy. General? Well, it, we need to be very clear. He, he hadn't been appointed. He's been nominated, and he's got to go through a confirmation process. So nobody, sh you know, for the sake of General Dayton, uh, and the sake of his uh, confirmation process, nobody should get out in front of the process. I certainly hope uh, he is confirmed. Uh, the Senate has this uh, responsibility. Uh, he's, he uh, has so much experience in the region and, and understands what's going on. And of course, he's a part of the Defense uh, Review and Advisory Board uh, there, along with other senior retired uh, allied generals working uh, in Ukraine frequently. So he he will bring so much credibility and insight um, that I think bodes well uh, for this relationship. 
plus he understands the region, uh, not just Ukraine. So I hope he is confirmed. Um, but um, it's, it's an election year. Uh, Ukraine's um, it's been an issue um, for uh, the administration, obviously, but also for the, his uh, political opponent. And so I think the, the confirmation hearing, well, um, some of this uh, will get played out there. I agree, and I uh, did try and check this morning to see if there's any uh, at least projected time for the hearing, and I was not able to find that. Uh, obviously, the Senate uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs could schedule it, and it could be a couple days from now, but uh, I wasn't able to find any anything out. Um, Archeon? Yeah, uh, Georgia would seem the most natural maritime partner for Ukraine. What is the actual state of... Uh, cooperation. Stephen? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, significant maritime cooperation between either Ukraine and uh, between Ukraine and Georgia. Um, I, I, it would be a good idea, I suppose, but I have not seen anything. Uh, maybe Admiral Kavanyenko knows more about this, but I've never seen anybody discuss that. Uh, have you seen anything, Admiral? Uh, yes, last year it was a very interesting, uh, you know, deployment of uh, Ukrainian Navy assets for participation in the uh, uh, NATO exercise on the territory of Georgia. And uh, if you remember, Russia during this exercise closed these in, uh, areas uh, for uh, firing exercises uh, just in the central part of uh, the sea because our reconnaissance ship uh, took part in this exercise. Uh, from Ukrainian Navy, uh, this ship. And of course, uh, our uh, uh, amphibious uh, and special operation forces uh, representatives. So it was very nice exercise. I think this year we also, uh, our, our personal and assets will participate in this exercise. And of course, uh, cooperation still continue because uh, uh, Georgian uh, Coast Guard assets uh, are taking part in Seabreeze exercise this year as well. And of course, uh, of, uh, and of course uh, last year, uh, the head of uh, Coast Guard, Jordan head of Coast Guard, uh, took part in the Maritime Security Conference in Odessa. So it's, uh, it's a lot of activities, and I think we will keep the same level of uh, such uh, cooperation. General? Uh, if I could offer uh, two additional points, and of course I would defer to uh, the Admiral, on these, but in my experience is that uh, the signals intelligence services of navies in general, regardless of what country, tend to be the best that any nation has. I, I'm an army guy, but the US Navy, uh, hands down, is the best signals intelligence uh, capability in the United States, and I've seen this in other navies. I would imagine that the Ukrainian Navy and the Navy, uh, the maritime forces of Georgia, such as they are, probably could cooperate uh, uh, in this particular area, uh, along with Romania and other countries uh, in the region on signals intelligence in particular, in order to make sure that we all have a much better uh, common operating picture or, or what uh, we call uh, an unblinking eye of what the heck is going on in the Black Sea region. Now, that, would, that would be number one. Number two, uh, there is a lot of progress being made in uh, unmanned maritime systems. Uh, NATO has a very good program underway right now. Uh, so what we're talking about, of course, is drones for the surface or underwater, which are ideal for uh, anti-submarine warfare um, and, and countermine operations. Uh, this is an area where I think, particularly somebody like Georgia, that doesn't have the resources or the infrastructure to start building ships or even receiving large vessels, but an area for cooperation uh, in unmanned maritime systems. Uh, I think both Ukraine and Georgia uh, ought to look at doing this to complement the vessels that they do have. Mark Allen. Yeah, um, another question here. Uh, based on the uh, Sea of Azov uh, precedent, uh, is there a real and present threat to uh, shipping using Odessa? Stephen? Yes. Um, there has been a threat to Odessa from the beginning of the invasion. 
according to Ukrainian sources that I've spoken with, as a matter of fact, Odessa was the ultimate operational target. The Russian, the forces that took over Crimea were supposed to also move on Odessa and foment riots there. They had troops, air, airborne troops lined up at Tiraspol in Moldova, 80 kilometers away, who would move down the road, supposedly to, to retrieve the situation in Odessa because of the rioting and the unrest against Russians. The Ukrainian authorities suppressed that and Odessa was saved. So the threats that are taking place in the Sea of Azov, both the maritime and both the economic, certainly pertain to Odessa because Odessa is the last major port left to Ukraine in the Black Sea. And the Russians could, take out, could undertake a series of different kinds of operations using their forces in the Black Sea. They could launch an amphibious operation against Mariupol and uh, uh, use the land forces in the Donbass for that purpose as well, and then clear out all of that area and then be able to threaten Odessa even more. They could shell Odessa from the sea or shell the Ukrainian ground forces uh, uh, or towns along the Black Sea coast. And of course, they could uh, uh, undertake naval operations against Ukraine's Navy as well. So Odessa definitely is to some degree at risk and what we see in the Sea of Azov uh, and the threats to the freedom of the seas into Ukraine's maritime sovereignty, which we've discussed, are for real and are linked with the broader strategic plan. Yes, General. I would only add one thing. Uh, I spoke with a very senior Ukrainian naval officer uh, last year. And he told me he actually was more worried about <clears throat> what was inside Odessa than he was what was coming from uh, the sea. Uh, specifically, as you know, Odessa really consists of about five or six different ports, the Odessa uh, harbors uh, system. Uh, and the port operators, in, in many of the cases, are Russian companies. And so, um, this is not news to the government of Ukraine, of course, but the, the fact that you've got Russian companies having uh, leverage or authority or that kind of investment in Odessa creates a vulnerability. So uh, this is something that I would imagine that the Admiral could answer, could explain better than me. But when I was a little bit alarmed and perhaps naive uh, when, when I heard that that was in fact the case, but I assume that Ukraine is obviously watches that Sure. And let me also add a couple of words uh, uh, for in this regard, uh, because it's only a very narrow strip, just uh, leave uh, between uh, Serpent Island and uh, occupied gas rigs for international uh, uh, traffic, uh, traffic for uh, sea, maritime, uh, international maritime routes. So it's under full control of Russian Federation because they uh, uh, deployed on those rigs some naval assets, uh, uh, not only their radars, but also other uh, assets uh, to control this area. So it's, uh, it's really not uh, not easy situation. It's a lot of threats uh, in different from different areas, from different, not only maritime, but as General Hodgin mentioned, in, inside base uh, this port hub, huge Odessa port hub. So the uh, situation is, is not easy and uh, of course we should uh, respond adequately. Can't hear you, Robert. Our time is coming to an end. Is there a question or two that we can end with here? Yeah, I, I just have one more a question and I apologize to anybody who sent a question and uh, I, I may have overlooked. Uh, how is Russian activity affecting uh, Ukrainian or uh, traditional Ukrainian commercial activities such as fishing? Industrial fishing, I assume uh, uh, the question is here. Uh, just short answer. Probably you know that some incidents uh, took place in this year of Azov. Uh, and uh, of course it's a problem because uh, st still continue to, you know, it's uh, it's some part of uh, this uh, Sea of Azov Treaty and uh, still continue 
uh, to be a negotiation between the, the two countries about, uh, about fishing quotes. And of course, from, from my perspective, experts think what this should be uh, canceled uh, because uh, in some areas uh, in the vicinity of our coastline, uh, the Russian, uh, uh, Russian uh, vessels uh, can fish uh, you know, different types of, 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 of uh, fisher uh, can provide fishing. So this is uh, some element what also has uh, some hybrid hybrid aspects and uh, uh, the, the problem still exists and uh, uh, not, uh, not, this is not only some uh, fishing, but also uh, economic, uh, economic, uh, uh, economic aspects uh, because it's uh, they should consider this together if uh, uh, ports uh, activities uh, if uh, uh, some economic activities at, at, at this uh, uh, area so it's not easy it's not easy pro it's a problem and still continue to be and of course it's it needs to be finalized uh, thank you, Admiral. I, uh, I really, our time is coming to an end. I, I thank the panelists and I certainly append the uh, attendees. I would give each panelist an opportunity for a closing comment if they would like. Uh, should we go in the same order if, if you have one, uh, General? I, I just want to reiterate the importance of having a, a strategy for the greater Black Sea region and for the nations of the region to put their voices together in Washington, D.C. and in Brussels to explain why it's, it's to the benefit of us that we take the initiative there, not leave the initiative to the Kremlin. I, they'd be well advised to do it and to have you help them with their, their uh, talking points. Uh, Admiral? And from my perspective, it is important to concentrate efforts to on implementation of mosquito fleet concept uh, for Ukraine uh, to be more proactive in, in different spheres to how to uh, protect uh, maritime interests and uh, protect uh, uh, Ukrainian sovereign right at sea. And of course, cooperation. Cooperation is it's the best tool to uh, uh, together to solve uh, the problems what exist right now. Thank you, Stephen. Three quick points. First, Ukraine must continue to make reforms necessary to strengthen its ability to fight off the Russians and the internal pathologies that the Russians exploit, like corruption, in order to prove to itself and to the rest of Europe that it is fit to join the European Union and NATO. Second, we here in Washington and, and as well in Brussels need to understand why the war in Ukraine must, uh, Ukraine must be supported because it's in our vital interest to do so. And third, as with the General Hodges, in the strongest possible terms, it is essential that the US, NATO, and other interested states who have a major stake in Mediterranean and Black Sea security understand the centrality of this region for international security. Thank you. Well, Don? Uh, Bob, thank you. Thank you very much for this amazing opportunity. And I want to thank uh, US Ukraine Foundation for this great event for Ukraine, for our maritime security. And uh, I think we will cooperate more and more in this in this fee. And thank you very much one more time. Well, thank you. Uh, before we sign off, I would like to uh, let everybody know that uh, we have, we, the foundation, have another webinar tomorrow, also Crimea, Crimea Today, the Past as Prologue. That one, that uh, webinar will start at 10 o'clock uh, Washington time. With that, I say goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. And thank you everyone who's been watching and, uh, and listening. Until tomorrow, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. All Thank the best. you.